Um, our next speaker is Dr. Vish Vishwanath. Um, he is the Lee Kum Kee Professor of Health Communication in the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the Harvard School of Public Health and in the McGraw-Patterson Center for Population Sciences at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. I should tell you that uh, the organizers of this, um, uh, of this conference, uh, none of us have a deep background in public health, but we had an idea of the different types of people that we wanted to bring together, people who were very effective in their respective domains, but certainly didn't know us and may not know each other. But we were looking for a model of a scholar who you know, was both doing important work in health and and of its own, but also doing work in communication, not just doing it, but sort of building an educational enterprise and helping other uh, folks do it. And when we ran across uh, the profile and work of, of Dr. Viswanath, it was like we, we found what we were looking for uh, in terms of you know uh, a, a focal point or something to which we could aspire. So we're thrilled to have you here, and we're uh, excited to hear your talk about communication inequalities. Thank you for coming. So first, uh, let me start by thanking you for having me here. I'm kind of an odd person out. I don't do high falutin, high power theory work, you know. Uh, but uh, uh, now hopefully you will be happy with my pebbles of wisdom that I'm going to offer in the next few minutes. And also I have put together a whole bunch of slides so that you have this illusion that I took my assignment very seriously and that, that I'm, I too am a scholar who can hang around here, you know, but I'll, I'll, I'll work very hard to disabuse you of that notion pretty soon here. Uh, so I, I really want to make uh, you know, three or four points. And I, I don't feel compelled to go through every slide, every bullet point. Uh, but I just want to make uh, three points, um, as I said, in our three acts, you know, to, to talk about what I want to do uh, as, as a part of this. And I think one, um, you know, on, uh, I, I focus uh, essentially around issues of inequalities and poverty. So, so and, and, and what I talk about uh, in terms of uh, the challenges in communicating science uh, deal with uh, are, 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 are focused around uh, those who experience adversities in their life, you know, uh, and, 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 and the institutional and the social context in which they live their lives. You know? so, so whatever I, I say, I think, you know, uh, generally uh, take that particular uh, perspective or bias, if you will. You know? uh, so let me, let me start by, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, I think, you know, the, the uh, reason I think, you know, we are all concerned about this is because of this amazing uh, biomedical revolution. I, you know, I live in Cambridge. Uh, my my institution is in Longwood Medical Area, you know, which is you know, where uh, where some of this uh, work is done, and it's just incredible what what is happening, both in terms of both biomedical and informatics revolution, and that's the reason we are worried about it because we are generating this tremendous amount of information, uh, and and uh, and not only generating it now, we have these platforms through which we are trying to disseminate them uh, very successfully. So the 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 question, I think, is you know, how do you translate it? And you know, when you communicate science, essentially we are talking about knowledge translation, right? That's the language I understand. How do you translate this knowledge uh, to really influence whether policy and practice? I think so. Uh, I'll, uh, so there are three broad points I want to make or draw your attention to just for discussion purposes. So one is, I think, you know, how do we produce uh, you know this notion of science or health information? For the public arena, I'm not talking about the scientific enterprise, you know, NIH, NSF, and others, but for the public arena, how do we produce uh, this? And and I think, uh, uh, you know, I think we will hear uh, tomorrow, I guess, you know, from you, you know, how how from that perspective. Uh, but I think um, so. We we know. Uh, I think you know uh, there are. A, 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 you know, if, if you are if you are a scientist, you know, we carve out these different niches for ourselves, right? So, so somebody will focus on social networks, someone will focus on institutions, someone will focus on journalism. But essentially, there are a whole bunch of these different varieties of sources of information. Mass media being one of them, uh, and and I think tomorrow uh, or today, I guess, you know, we will hear 
uh, about uh, particularly one kind of mass mediated communication, popular culture and movies. Uh, but you know, what I want to do is you know, focus a little bit on journalism today you know, and how the role of journalism in producing and translating that knowledge. But I also want drawn to draw your attention to two other issues, the role of private sector in influencing risk communication uh, and, and activist groups. I think we already spent a lot of time on activist groups, but I won't say a lot on it. So I think you know, despite our, uh, uh, our sentiments, uh, that you know, journalism as we know it is disappearing, uh, and 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 that you know people are getting their information from other sources other than journalism, right? And you know, so every time you hear, you know, someone will say, "Oh, well, they are all hearing John Stewart. That's where they are getting this information, or wherever, right?" You know, but the fact of the matter remains that journalists are really important gatekeepers. They continue to be important gatekeepers, interacting with institutions that produce this knowledge very continuously, right? And there are a variety of things about journalism and journalists that interest us. And there are two or three things I just want to highlight for discussion purposes uh, before I move on. One is I think you know, journalists are, you know, I, I think uh, are not particularly trained the way you would expect uh, you know, scientists and 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 others are, uh, are 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 likely to be trained. Are you know? So we spent a lot of time talking about probabilities, etc. But that's not how journalists are trained. In fact, uh, uh, there are not a lot of surveys of of, uh, of of health journalists out there. We did one of them uh, when I was uh, at NCI as I was leaving the National Cancer Institute, and we found out that you know about. Now, you know, 8% of the reporters actually had any life sciences background, right? You know, so some of us who have taught in journalism schools before we abandoned you know, them, you know, know that, you know, you know, students often say, right, I'm in journalism because I hate numbers. Uh, but I think, you know, it's, it's beyond that. It's a question of, you know, uh, it's not that that by itself is wrong. I'm just saying it's a, it's a worldview, right? You know, so when you are not coming come from a life sciences perspective, but a, a humanities perspective, there's nothing wrong with it. But it's a particular worldview that filters what you get as information and equips you to look at certain things, right? You know, so the, I think that's one issue in terms of training. The other part of the training, which I did not uh, refer to in the paper, is seldom, with rare exceptions, say New York Times or whatever it is, right? With rare exceptions, most of the journalists are on the beat. Health journalists on the, are on the beat for three or four years maximum, right? So if you invest in them and train them to report on health or science, you know, you can do that, but within three years, they have gone on to report on crime or whatever, other, some other baits, I think. And so they, I think these, these things do pose a challenge. And, and the third uh, aspect of it is, you know, so uh, journalists still continue to, again, you know, I'm not talking about Gina Colatas of the world, you know, so those are exceptions. But, but, but in general, most of them rely on institutional sources. You know, we kept probing and asking them, where do you get your ideas about health, community, health you know? And, and, and they get their ideas from news releases. You know, JAMA routinely releases a news story. My institution, your institution, our institutions are very anxious about you know, these, these one-time studies and we release a news release and we are very happy that our name is in the paper and the institution and you know, the, the, whoever the communications officer is reports the dean. See, there are five mentions or 10 mentions or 50 mentions of our faculty in the newspaper, right? You know, so, so I think, you know, so they, and re reporters do rely on them. You know, actually we thought, you know, if you're a health journalist or a science journalist, you will, you will actually take initiative I know you have this, you know, we take this physiognomic approach, you know, you have the nose for the news, but actually they are relying on, on institutional sources, I think. So these are some of the limitations which influence the way news uh, or science or health news is, is communicated, which poses particular challenges in the way, you know, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the way public receives or publics receive science information, right? So unlike Denise Grady or somebody who takes a lot of time looking through the articles and say, okay, what can I make and synthesize it? You know, but that is very unusual, I think. That's very unusual. The routine is they, they just take the news releases and put them out, right? And these are not very particularly helpful in many ways. The, uh, 
and I, I won't go through the tables. I have, uh, uh, you know, um, I think they are in the paper. Uh, you know, interested in it. The other other issue on risk communication is we seldom take into account what the private sector is saying or not saying or distorting risk. I think you know so. If you think about it, we are not the only people out there producing evidence-based communications for public consumption. There's a whole sector of people who are also communicating about science or miscommunicating about science or distorting science, I think, you know, right? So, uh, and, and I think uh, it's well documented, for example, tobacco industry knew, you know, one of the uh, interest, most interesting things that some of you uh, are familiar with is if you go through the tobacco papers uh, that were released as a part of the master settlement agreement, tobacco industry knew Right, uh, everything we found out as scientists subsequently, the relationship between tobacco use and health, they knew it long time ago, and they have had a fantastic strategic plan on how to communicate or how to distort risk information in the public arena. So, if you, you know, in fact, we published the tobacco monograph uh, in, as a part of the NCI. If you, uh, you know, so we have two chapters in that monograph which clearly showed how they had a list of reporters they wanted to talk to. They had a list of people who will testify on their behalf in distorting risk information uh, and connecting uh, um, 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 you know, health and tobacco use. In fact, no, as I said in the, in the, in the paper, uh, Justice uh, Judge uh, um, uh, Gladys Kessler, who authored one of the uh, tobacco decisions, you know, actually said it in her decision. You know, the tobacco industry has so much money for its communications budget that it easily distort this kind of information and, and found them liable for that, right? So I think that's something to think about. And I have put in a, just a couple of numbers to think about. You know, the, we know these are three big risk-causing industries, you know, so fast food industry uh, uh, and, and tobacco and, and, and sugar sweetened beverages. Think about sugar sweetened beverages, you know, Coke, et cetera. So now we have a fairly good evidence you know, that uh, SSBs are, uh, are one of the major contributors to the obesity problem in the country. What about how much money do they spend, right? So yesterday was some bit of a good news. Philadelphia passed the, the tax on sugar sweetened beverages, but most of them have failed, right? And I think, uh, and, and if you look up at the budget, right, these are the communication and advertising budgets of these uh, organizations, and this is just Coke. I mean, I'm not including Pepsi and others, right? And and they, you know, what what is interesting is, you know, even cigarettes, for example, tobacco has tremendous restrictions on what they can say and how they can say. Yet, you know, they are spending about ten billion dollars a year. And I, I was at NCI, and I had some budget on some of these communication things. You know, we could never, even all the states put together, do not have this kind of a budget. So when you're trying to communicate risk, you know, it's just not you or I communicating risk, but it is a private sector. I think that is playing a very critical role in communicating this kind of a risk. I think. And I won't spend a lot of time on activist groups. Uh, Dan uh, started talking about it. I'm sure Sarah uh, will have uh, something to say about it. But as a member of the, I chaired the National Vaccine Advisory Committee's um, uh, Vaccine Confidence Working Group. We had Dan and others speak, uh, speak to our committee, testify. And I can tell you, you know, um, uh, the, I mean, I'm on the blacklist of uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure you know, NVIC, as they call them, so it's a National Vaccine Information Center. Uh, and, and it's quite interesting you know, how, uh, if you go to their websites, and they are using numbers, graphs, charts, uh, the same things we use, uh, but the framing is completely different, I think. You know, so, and, and activist groups come into this picture. Uh, you know, I think that's where you're talking about a noxious political environment when you politicize these issues. And so again, communicating risk, uh, so one, one example is India has one of the highest cervical cancer rates in the world, right, next only to breast cancer, right? But uh, cervical cancer vaccine, the HPV vaccine is banned in the country, right? It's banned, actually, because six girls died uh, as a result of administration of the vaccines. 
uh, of course, and you start investigating it, the deaths had nothing to do with the vaccines, but the, uh, the interest groups got hold of it and said this uh, a, a multinational uh, corporations, it's imperialist companies you know, coming in and, and, and administering drugs to our girls, you know, and, and that kind of a framing was very successful in distorting risk information around that, right? So uh, both pro and anti uh, science groups or interest groups are there out there, which also communicate the risk for the public, I think. So that's one part of it. The second part uh, I want to go through very quickly is no wonder people are seeing all this information and they're tremendously confused, I think. Unless you're very engaged public or publics, you know, it's very difficult for you. And I will talk, especially when the people I work with, you know, who are, you know, who are dealing with a tremendous number of challenges in their day-to-day -day lives, you know, this is, this is just one part of it. This is only one part of their life. We're not talking about health or science. And, and no wonder, you know, they're, what they're seeing is incidental exposure as much as anything else, right, to risk information. I think tomorrow you will talk about some of that. Uh, and, and this incidental exposure, no wonder, because you're not spending a lot of time thinking about it, creates a lot of confusion among them, right? So if when we, you know, uh, 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 and, and I think there are a lot of problems with it. We have talk, already talked about innumeracy and illiteracy issues. My uh, former uh, mentee, Rebecca Negler, uh, who's at Minnesota, often talks about lack of research literacy, you know, because people don't understand how science works. You know, so most of the news coverage is episodic. So coffee is good for you today, coffee is bad for you tomorrow. And people are wondering, okay, what the heck am I supposed to do? How do I make a decision about the risk of coffee drinking if every day they are changing their recommendations, right? And no wonder, you know, we, we have, um, if, you, if you go through the Health Information National Trend Survey, which is the only public use data set in health communications, which is available to anybody, you know, you can just go and download this data set. There are six waves of surveys that have been done and you know, trying to understand the health communication behaviors of American publics. Clearly, you know, people say, you know, more than 50% of the people agree with the statement, everything causes cancer. Of course, you know, because every time you turn around, you know, there is some risk about cancer. 15% uh, said nothing could reduce a person's risk of getting a cancer. And also, you can, you can see why people get confused unless something happens to me, then I go to someone like Peter and say, okay, tell me a little bit about what the problem I'm having, then I might start engaging and paying attention. But until then, it's just this miasma of information out there, uh, along with health, uh, along with science, along with Trump, along with everything else, right? It's a larger context, I think. So this, I think people do get this very distorted picture of disease causation and risk uh, because of these consequences. Now. Uh, in, in, the, in the few minutes I have, let me go to the heart of what I, my, my interest is. You know? So I work with, my interest is in how does this transfer to, trans, translate to inequalities in, uh, in communications. So uh, I, I'm sure Sarah will talk about health disparities. Uh, this is pretty much very well documented. You know, the entire idea of social determinants of health, a term I actually don't like. You know, social determinants sounds very... These are social drivers of inequalities rather than social determinants. It's very deterministic language, uh, as if we can't do much about it. But these, the, the entire body of work clearly shows that, in general, those who are from a higher socioeconomic position, those who are generally whites, those who live in urban areas, uh, the intersectionality of this, uh, enjoy better health. Uh, and living conditions compared to other people. I think you know, there are some exceptions, you know, the, the Hispanic paradox that we talk about and few other things, but this is a general story that there are problems. For example, if you look at tobacco, you know, we have been pretty successful in tobacco control program, but the benefits from tobacco control programs have not accrued equally across different social groups. And people know this, you know, so I don't need to go through this. So the question is on how this is also in India, just lest you think you know, this is only in the US, it's all over, I think. But the larger point I want to say is, you know, just like uh, 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 wealth, just like health, 
communication resources are also unequally distributed, I think, you know. And, and, and we have documented over the last 12 years in our research program this unequal distribution of communication resources, both at a macro level and at a micro level. At a macro level, I think, you know, uh, different, there are tremendous differences in the generation and manipulation and processing of information uh, between different social groups and institutions. I just gave you examples of tobacco or, or, or sugar sweetened beverages, you know, where they have billions of dollars to really produce this information, disseminate this, process it and disseminate it, causing seeds of doubt among the publics compared to others, right? You know, uh, on the other hand, it also manifests at the individual level in the way people access information, in the way people process information, and in, in the way people act on that information, right? And um, a couple of examples uh, I, 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 to just to show you. Uh, uh, so, for example, if, if you ask, uh, so uh, if you read the newspapers, there is this daily celebratory coverage of how internet is changing our lives, right? We bank, we play, we watch, we read, we work, you know, with, with, with this wonderful new thing called the internet. And, but if you look at the, and, and, and if you look at Pew news releases, you know, uh, and they routinely celebrate this, right? But if you look at who has access to it, you know, the numbers are around, um, you know, 70 to 80 percent. Our argument is even that 70 to 80 percent is overestimate. We have found out that people go on and off, go on and off the grid. In fact, if you are poor, uh, you have access to the internet for a couple of months. Then you don't pay the bills. You lose the access for a couple of months. Then you start saving money and pay the bills. Then you get back into access, uh, get back the access to internet. Right. So the communication services are not continuously accessed by people who are poor. Right? So there is inconsistent dis, uh, access to this kind of a communication resources. Cell phones are a good example. People think everybody has a cell phone, which is true. But if you start looking at investigating whether, uh, in fact, we are in the field, even as we speak, doing the so-called M health study, we are full of buzzwords, E health and M health. And, and if, you, you know, if you look at people who have access to cell phones, People do have access to cell phones, but the number of them lose connections to cell phones every few months or so um, because they can't pay the bills. And if you look at the instruments or the sole actual phones they have, they have a lot of uh, challenges in terms of the hardware, right? You know, we can't load, right now we have an app which tracks everything they are doing. We can't load that app because the cell phones they have do not have the capacity or the bandwidth to, to hold these apps, right? So they have, the, you know, uh, I have the numbers. I won't go through it, uh, but 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 uh, what it what has clearly become uh, an issue for us is uh, they lose access every so few months. Uh, they don't have very sophisticated cell phones. Uh, number three, they are also facing evictions. They move from place to place, right? Uh, and, and in that process, they lose that connection, right? They don't go out and bother to change addresses. They are, uh, are, they, are uh, they are in shelters because of violence and abuse. And this becomes a real challenge to provide that continuous access. You know? So accessing telecommunication services is a major, major problem, I think. You know? So that's one part of it. And there are also data which, which goes back all the way from 20 to 30 years in terms of actual usage, time spent reading and monitoring this stuff. But let me uh, highlight two more points uh, and then uh, stop there. Uh, we also found out that it's very difficult for them to process this information. The processing part of it is because, because of the tremendous stress, you know, the so-called daily hassles in their lives, uh, make it very difficult for them to zero in and focus on health itself, right? You know, so I think, uh, uh, Shah and Mullah and Nathan and others have done some interesting work in terms of scarcity. You know, I think you know, if you're daily struggling with issues of scarcity of time and resources, it's very difficult to focus your attention on health itself, right? You know, you're cognitively, you're challenged because there are so many pressures from so many areas in your daily life. Uh, and so there's no wonder that they don't necessarily focus on health because they're worried about other things, you know. And last, they can't act on them. You know, they can't, even if they know, they cannot act on this information. You know, my tell my colleagues, you know, 
People should eat healthy. People should go out and engage in physical activity. Yeah, that sounds very nice, except if you live in neighborhoods where you, you know, gun violence or gunshots are heard routinely or violent neighborhoods. You know, so it's a very simple thing. You, know, you don't have access to the kind of grocery stores which serve healthy food. You know, you, I work in, in, a, in a city which is full of bodegas. It doesn't have one major grocery store. You know, if you go to a bodega, uh, the Spanish uh, grocery stores, it's very interesting. Uh, it's in Lawrence, you know, which is 80% Latino. The bodegas, and the first thing you, as soon as you walk in, is a two liter bottle of Coke, right? All the vegetables and fruits are in the back of this in small store, I think. So it's very difficult for people to act on these things uh, and, and information. So what are the solutions? I think the solution is, you know, we have been trying to develop a number of them. I think there are at the policy level, the net neutrality ideas, and then the FCC has become finally a bit more aggressive on some of these things. Uh, Korea and others have made policy decisions where they think, you know, internet is like a utility and states should subsidize it. I think Obama administration has been doing some of that. Cell phones are essential, so they're subsidizing cell phones, I think. Uh, Working with community groups, what we do, what is called as participatory interventions, but participatory research, and you know, working with community groups who are more trusted by the poor is another way to do that. We have a number of interventions which are doing that. And third, I think, you know, is really working with institutions. And I think reporters is not a lost cause. Producers are not, you know, work with people who actually are much more sensitized to to these issues and work with them in kind of constructing these images and messages and stories that could potentially be communicative, I think. I'm sorry I've gone on a bit long here, but uh, let me stop here. Uh, I think I hopefully I made the three points I wanted to make. Thank you. Is that what we'll have? Uh, so uh, we can take some questions. I'll go to you first. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Hi, I'm Patricia Anderson, the Emerging Technologies Informationist for the Health Sciences okay. here. Um, question, I've been live tweeting, and there's a question from the Twitter audience about how this impacts with vulnerable <coughs> populations, especially those with memory or cognitive impairment. So the, um, so we haven't, um, um, spent a lot of time so uh, working with people that have those kinds of impairments so uh, I cannot really comment on it and I don't have the kind of evidence base or the knowledge base uh, to talk in an informed way about it so I better not say anything on that. I'll take the, I'll take the next question just because there, there's something that you said at the end and it's inherent in a lot of what you do. I think at universities, you know, at medical schools or at universities, when we think about engaging with the public, we often imagine that they have the time and space to engage in abstractions and sort of our conceptual frameworks. And, you know, it's, I, I struggle to try and tell people, sometimes I try to tell narratives about the daily life of the person we're trying to reach and, you know, how it is, you know, can we find an intersection between what we're trying to do and that person's daily life? In, in what you've done at your center, is there, like, can you give me a better example of like what I'm trying to say? Like, have you had, have you ever identified a population, gone in, kind of changed the narrative and seen a result, like seen them actually, seen behavioral change? Yeah, uh, so for, um, l let us take um, um, tobacco use, right? So um, there's still about 20, 25% of the America, it's between 18 to 22 percent, depending on whose numbers you believe, uh, 18 to 20 percent to continue to use tobacco. Um, and, uh, um, uh, but if you, if you look at actually who smokes or who is continuing to use tobacco, it is disproportionately uh, those who are under federal poverty level, right? And FPL are poor, right? You know, so about 35 percent, right? Um, so the question is, you know, how do you um, encourage them to quit? Um, they know tobacco use is bad, and it's not that they're not aware of it. Uh, they also know they're paying a lot of money to buy these cigarettes because these are high, heavily taxed, right? But so telling them uh, that to quit tobacco so that you can save money and you can be healthy is, is one of the lamest things we can ever do, right? And that's what the campaigns have been doing, right? On the other hand, if there was a one recent intervention by a colleague of mine 
where she actually uh, did the intervention, but I connected them to community resources that can address other issues in their lives, right? That can also address other issues in their lives, the issues they are facing, whether it's unemployment, job skills, child care, etc. And her, the quit rate in the intervention group is two times that of the control group. Right. So that's an example of where you take the social context into account, the daily challenges into account, and, and identify solutions to, uh, to meet those challenges, which could potentially have a uh, bigger impact on their uh, behavior, I think. Uh, same thing with the uh, bodegas experiment uh, in, 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 in this community. What is interesting is, you know, telling the bodegas, you know, which are all small business owners, that they should somehow serve healthy food, uh, is, is, you know, is, is laughable in the sense, you know, these are uh, the so-called mom and pop stores, you know, trying to uh, make a living, uh, and and any any distortion in the in the way they market these projects could be uh, financially ruinous. Uh, for these stores, you know, but working with them, so that this this coalitions we are working with have actually worked with these bodegas, you know, in 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 helping them reorganize their uh, their their stores, and but involving them in designing the solutions right from the beginning, not going and telling them on how to do this, but actually. You know, involving them in characterizing the problem and designing the solution. At which point they are better able to implement it. I think so that's another you know yeah. way to think about some of these issues. So I don't know whether it addresses your question. No, there, or not. That's exactly. There are so many people I think in the science communication community who could really benefit from just looking at you know these types of examples and what your center has done, because so often we start with these stereotypes of the other. And then we give information based on the stereotypes rather than the real lives that people are living and the real challenges they face day to day. And so I think you know, what, what you've described and what you're doing is just an exemplar. Uh, Professor Dan Kahan has a question. So you make a really compelling case about the inequality of the access to the direct, uh, or almost primary information. They're not really primary information, but the, the, the information that is available through um, internet and other uh, kinds of media. I'm wondering about how to think about the diffusion of the, that impact because most people even who have access to that information aren't going to be pouring through it, but they're going to be getting the benefit really of other people pouring through it because they're inside of networks that um, have smart people in them and they're informed. <coughs> yeah, it's a good strategy to kind of look at people who know what they're doing and see what but if you're in a community where there's already that kind of restriction to the access, it's going to have an even bigger rippling effect. And I'm wondering if you think about that, or how would you, how could someone even estimate that? Because I have a feeling if you, and maybe you say, oh, I've already done it. <laughs> but it's probably, it actually would probably magnify that inequality by right. quite a big factor. Right. So um, um, I apologize, but let me start with an incident. Personalize this, you know, and and because to, it it speaks to your point. But I seldom want to talk about myself. But you know, here let me make an exception, right? So when I moved to uh, Boston uh, from Washington D.C., you know, Sarah and I were talking about you know the cold weather from Washington to Boston, right? And as I developed a cold and a flu. And I was looking for a primary care physician. I just moved into the town, and I was looking for, OK. So I kept calling the doctors, and all of them said, we can't take new patients. Right? Every one of them said, we don't have room for new patients. So I called up a friend of mine at Harvard in the medical school and said, hey, Eric, man, I need a doctor, and I'm sick. You know? And he said, oh, I'll get back to you in, in 10 minutes. Just wait. Next 10 minutes later, he calls me back and says, Wish, go and see this physician. You know, tell, uh, they are, they're waiting for your call. And I was thinking, what the heck? So do I have to be a Harvard professor to get a primary care physician? What if I don't have someone in my social network who has these connections, right? So, so I think this point you're raising is extremely important because we actually looked at some of these heterophily versus homophily, you know, heterogeneous networks versus homogeneous networks. If, you know, so we have been introducing this idea. You know, we are looking at the data. We can't say the notion of information segregation. You know, so you are in certain pockets where you don't have this kind of a 
you know, heterogeneous information from outside your social networks, and that can prove that much more difficult, whether it is on schooling, right, advising on physicians, you know, which physician should I go to, or which school should I send my kid to, or, or it's, so th I think that is an issue, I think. But let me just step back in one way, and say, I, I'm not suggesting that these people are not smart, right? In this country, if you are poor, you have to be smart to navigate the system and survive in the system. So there are times when they are successfully getting this information and navigating it. You know, and that's what we are looking for. What are these openings you know, where they do seem to go beyond their networks and share this information within those networks? Uh, that we have not done that yet. But I think this is an important point you're raising, I think. So. The next question will come from Professor Brandon Nyan. So, um, yeah, I appreciate you drawing our attention to, to inequality because so much of the science communication debate is about basically people's mental model who we're trying to communicate with is college graduates who have polarized views about controversial <laughs> political issues, and you're talking about a, lot, a, a very different kind of communication problem. But I want to I want to push on one point that I think is 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 relevant to your presentation about tobacco, and I'm not a tobacco control expert by any means, but I do think it's an interesting case despite those vast numbers of dollars spent by the tobacco industry, there is overwhelming agreement among the public that smoking causes cancer, right? That is a communication, that is probably the most successful communication message of public health of the 20th century, right? It's a great victory, and it's clearly not the reason that people are still smoking, right? Like, that, that war was won, right? So what can we learn from that? Because that, that reached every, almost everybody, right? The, Agreement with that is higher than you know the Big Bang and evolution, almost any other scientific fact you can imagine, right? So why is that? What can we learn from that? And then what's the remaining problem? Mm -hmm. Sure. So, um, so in, in public health, we talk about a couple of success stories, right? One is tobacco, other is vaccination, right? And so these are two major success stories. So despite uh, NWIC and others, still 75, 80 to 85 to 90 percent of the parents actually get their children vaccinated. So two major success stories for two different reasons, I think. So tobacco, uh, I would argue that um, tobacco moved from the realm of pure science communication of risk to a, a, to a multi-level approach. And the multi-level approach includes policy changes, right? You know, so starting in 1970s, we banned uh, advertising on, on, on television, electronic media, increasing restrictions on, 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 uh, on where you can smoke, right? The, the indoor clean air acts that were passed, uh, the role of interest groups, you know, uh, including scientists who have changed the way we frame and the narrative by introducing these ideas of secondhand smoke and even, you know, uh, as Vinikoff and others talk about third-hand smoke. Uh, I think it's, it's a combination of, you know, changing the narrative and framing. It's a combination of interest groups being very active, countering the billions that is being spent by tobacco industry, collaborating with the government, institutions, and policy change. It's kind of a multi-level, the typical, the so-called social ecological approaches that have uh, taught us a useful lesson, I think. Um, em an empirical question, Brendan, would be, can we do that with sugar-sweetened beverages, right? We are, I think it's a different challenge, uh, particularly with food, uh, but I don't know. That's an empirical question, I think. Okay, uh, thank you. Our next question will be from Herschel Nachlas. Uh, yeah, so just a brief comment. And then... Brief comment and a question. So, uh, just just to push back a little bit on the, the tobacco success story. So, uh, your colleague uh, Alan Brandt, I think, uh, his book on, on the tobacco century shows, I think, at least as a political scientist, an interesting way in which institutional veto forms in Congress delayed uh, the speed at which uh, the sort of information that we now valorize uh, was disseminated to the public uh, in sort of uh, preventing the FDA and, and FCC from regulating tobacco in the way that we would like, uh, sort of as early as it might happen. Um, then just a, a quick question on, on the inequalities uh, and, and oh, sorry. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, and then just, just a quick question to, to kind of seek more information on the inequalities point. So it seems like one huge way that folks might get access uh, 
or, or might currently be getting unequal access to the kinds of information that, that we'd like is uh, just as a function of having insurance. Um, so to the extent that uh, connections to the medical care system is, is a primary mechanism by which this information is disseminated, um, it seems like insurance is, is going to play a big role. So I'm wondering if there's evidence from uh, any, any of your work or, or RAND or the Oregon experiment that, that speaks to, to this point. I'm wondering if anyone's aware, aware of that. Thanks. Um, so the thing, I, I, I'm not aware of, you know, um, I'm not aware of, there may be data out there, you know, uh, but not, I'm not aware of anything that explicitly looks that issue, you know. Uh, but I must say insurance is only one part of it. I think they do, uh, we, we did publish a one paper looking at the urban poor, uh, and we did uh, um, say that they, they do uh, access um, um, sites uh, and get information from the health systems they are connected to. I think that, that is true. Uh, but you know, a large number of them don't even go to the health systems, are not even connected to the health systems. You know? So the only time they connect to the health system is when they are really sick. You know, then they show up at the emergency rooms or they show up at the community health centers, the federal uh, uh, community health centers, you know, the safety net centers. But I, I think that may be one uh, solution, but I don't know that's a complete solution. I think they're much more likely, I think the community-based organizations are much more likely to be more successful in communicating this kind of information with them because they don't, so what happens the, from what we know, again, um, obviously my studies are um, you know, in Massachusetts. Um, 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 from what we know, they, they're not very selective in the way they choose these agencies and organizations to get what they want. They start with organizations that they're familiar with. So I go to the YWCA because YWCA has always been there for me on a variety of issues I face. And then the YWCA people become my navigators to connect me to other services, I think. You know, so that, that's one model we are able to document. You know. um, so I don't know for the insurance side. Now on the tobacco side, you know, the, my argument, I, I see what Alan has said and I, I agree with him. You know, and uh, tobacco industry continues to be successful, I mean, toward the steps uh, in, in completely implementing the, the recommendations of FCTC and others. But I do think, you know, if you're spending $10 billion, as Brendan was saying, you should see more success, right, uh, on their part. But they, we are not seeing that, you know, so, um, and which, which shows that it's not an easy thing, even because established commercial interests are always going to oppose any communication of risk and science you have. But, uh, but I think they are not as successful as they would have been. Uh, you know, the, 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 the interesting thing is, you know, uh, if you look at what they have been able to do in other countries, you know, where they have been able to thwart any steps, for example, right? So, so I would say uh, it's, it's still a success story. Maybe it's a much more slow-moving success than one would like to, uh, but it's a perspective, I think. It's a question of perspective. So. Uh, the next question will come from Professor Peter Ubel. Uh, yeah, um, you painted a dismal picture, but accurate, I think, of the quantity and quality of health journalism and some of the challenges that that faces. Um, you were at the NIH before you went to, to Boston. Do you feel like the public sector could do more to improve the situation? And specifically, like, what could the NIH or should the NIH do? So Peter, I think. Um, my argument is it's just not the NIH's problem. You know, I think um, the very fact that they employed someone like me at one time um, um, shows that they are interested in journalism and communications. Uh, the fact that you know you were a part of this, you know, we spent sixty million dollars uh, on communications research, which is extremely unusual, or fifty million dollars for the seekers, and created the hints. Uh, public use data set suggests that NIH is interested in it, but it's just not an NIH problem. I think it's our problem. I think, you know, uh, we collectively have to really take this problem head on. Our institutions, for example, right, you know, every time I publish a paper, someone calls me up and says, do you want a news release, you know, right, you know, I mean, my temptation is, you know, say, yeah, sure, why not, and I want to see my name in the paper. 
But this kind of an episodic coverage, I think, right, is a problem. So the institutions are a problem. But there is this organization called Association for Healthcare Journalists. And they are trying to organize themselves around these issues. They are very sensitive to it, Ivan Noransky and others. And they are able to actually develop some programs uh, in, in, in addressing this kind of a uh, human capital issue in journalism. I think the problem, the problem uh, there are two issues, I think, you know, in this. One is the media industry itself is changing so radically and so rapidly. And, and they're barely able to survive, I think, you know, so, uh, and, and, and I think, you know, so whatever investment an industry wants to make, you know, uh, uh, you know is, is changing because of some other problems they're facing. So that's one issue. Second is, as I said, uh, if you are investing within, by, uh, in reporters themselves rather than the institutional level, uh, it is still difficult because the, the nature of the journalism, I mean, the nature of the, uh, beat system, right? You know, they still stick to the beat system, and 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 as I said, you know, they move from beat to beat. So you can't invest in them um, a, a lot because you know they are reporting on something else tomorrow. Um, so my argument is, it depends on us. We can still work with reporters, but we are now increasingly focused on community-based organizations who are actually in the community, they have been in the community, they are trusted by the community, they have interest in it. The question is what kind of a tools and toolkits can we develop and provide and train their staff members? That's what we have been doing over the last six or seven years, really training the staff members of community-based organizations you know, in so-called evidence-based information and help them communicate with their clients. It's, uh, will we be successful? It's an empirical question, I think. I'm from Professor John Miller. Um, I'd like to return to the, to the point that uh, the question that was asked to Kish earlier about the, why it, is it that the tobacco was uh, more successful. And one of the things I think, uh, you know, one of the advantages of having done this for a few years, I, I have some memory of these things. The, the, the critical point in, in that, that tobacco issue was that the FCC, I think, was ruled that tobacco advertisement was subject to the equal time rule when there was an equal time rule. And there was some extremely creative uh, messages done in, in the anti-tobacco group, which then led the tobacco industry to quit advertising. Because if you were, the more you advertised, the more time you gave to the other side. And then very quietly, and that's particularly, I think, early in the Bush administration, um, equal time got taken out because the, the, the broadcast industry hated it. And most of the manufacturing or food and, and tobacco and other people didn't like it. But it does seem to me it's a good illustration of how public policy could influence the, the shape of communication. Because there was a time with equal time, when the equal time provision was in the Communication Act, that uh, groups could raise those issues and have some standing. And they have lost that standing in the last 10 or 15 years. But I think that, would, that may be something as we think about an agenda for our discussions, the fact that, that the equal time provision, without the equal time provision, I don't think the breakthrough would have occurred. My own, my own guess. I don't know if you agree with that or not. No, sure, John. I think um, what I would say, uh, to, so tobacco is a, you know, I mean, if you, you can go through um, sort of a milestones in tobacco control, right, starting in the 1964, I mean, even going back to 1950s, Richard Dahl and Richard Peto's studies, and how those sort of filtered into the non-scientific world and the inter and, uh, and, and influencing the Surgeon General. Uh, I think the we, we can certainly point out to individual milestones, uh, but I think the larger point here is how do we, how do interest groups, right, take up the cause of science and communication of science and use existing strategies creatively, right, to change a policy and practice. And, and I think tobacco teaches us those lessons, right? You know, so if it was not equal time rule, some other rule, right? And there could be something else, uh, right? Like the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control is using a different set of rules, right? Uh, because equal time rule is not prevalent in every other country. Uh, Australia has very advanced uh, tobacco control policies, uh, but, but not necessarily because of equal time rule. But I, so what I'm saying is, it's, I agree with you in the US history of tobacco control. But what I'm suggesting is it, it's this set of groups 
who are sophisticated in understanding science. So I understand what you are generating as a scientist. The question is how can I take it and then use it you know, for public consumption in a way that I can change practice and policy. And it is those knowledge brokers, if you will, that, I'm, that we are interested in, in, in pursuing. You know, so uh, so it, it depends. Okay, the final question for this session will come from Professor Mara Cecilia Ostfeld. Hi, thank you. Um, you bring up this really important and nuanced point about the issue of health disparities, and you, and you highlight the different aspects of it, that there's issues of access, um, there's issues of quality, um, and you really focus on your point about communication. But I, I, I'm hearing you, but I'm, I'm still skeptical about how much of a difference really high level communication to diverse communities would be just because of these points. So I know, for example, that fruits and vegetables are good for me, but I can't access them. I have to take a bus, and if I take this bus to the supermarket, they're not gonna be good. And there's the issue of relative importance. In the context of my life, that time is much better spent on, you know, spending time with my kid or, or getting a job or, or um, addressing some of the gun violence or keeping my kids out of gangs or, or something of that nature. And, it, um, and same thing with the tobacco issue. I mean, again, people know that tobacco is bad, but in the context of their life, it, it's, it seems much less significant than the other things going on. And I, it makes me think of, I remember when the Women, Infants, and Children program, they, they provide information to their clients that fruits and vegetables and iron and all this stuff is good for you. But I remember in my own family, people weren't really using that. So then they provided the vouchers. So people then had access, but the places were still really far away. It wasn't until they started providing those fruits and vegetables in the bodegas that they started using that. But even then, they tended to be like the crappier kinds, like really old bruised apples that they're like, I'm not gonna spend my whatever, I'd rather sell my voucher to somebody else. So I guess I'm just, I, I'm hearing your point, but I, I wanna hear you talk more about how much a difference you think, for example, higher level, higher quality journalism or higher access to quality journalism would make on these communities or in these communities. Right. Sure. Uh, so let me start by saying I'm a co communication scientist. So what I'm going to say is through communication-centric perspective, so other people can advocate their own perspectives, I think. Uh, but if you followed my definition, I said there are three dimensions to it, uh, to communication inequalities. One is accessing and time use type of a thing, you know. Second is processing that information. And third is acting capacity to act on that information. So, so if, you, if you do not meet all those three criteria, then you are not able to, you are not going to bring about the social change, I think. You know? So I am not, I am last person to argue that somehow if you build, they will come kind of a thing, right? You know, we found that, that's not going to happen. Now, that's the reason I think, you know, whatever we do, or our, our exemplar interventions, work with community groups are uh, precisely because we're extremely sensitive to the fact that people, you know, uh, that's, and I also said this, you know, people are not dumb, right? And people are very smart. They have to make these decisions every day in their lives. And the question is, you know, what can you do to facilitate that decision making uh, that will help them? Uh, and, and so it's, uh, it, it, it's the bodegas, it is the YWCAs, it is uh, other community agencies, you know, that have to work with them uh, on a variety of issues, you know, as I said, health is only one small concern in their life because they, you know, if you look at the totality of what they are facing day in and day out, they are not worried about what is being published uh, on, on any given day. They only have a zeitgeist thing, and, oh yeah, there's something about coffee, you know, but that, that's, that's not what I'm worried about. I'm worried about childcare, I'm worried about transportation. Uh, so uh, I, I'm, I'm, completely in agreement with you that we just can't focus on one issue uh, and expect somehow the, for them to take it up, you know. So. But I do think it's an important opening, uh, uh, an important toolkit for them. I think you know, communications is one critical part of this larger arsenal they should have, you know. So. There, there are so many important lessons in your work for, for all of us, and we appreciate you being here. Thank you very much.